Ralph. I think it's going to be one of the great articles in colleagues uh, across the. Having said that, evidence-based medicine uh, has some problems. Here we go with a little talk on evidence-based medicine. Okay, so uh, I put this together, <coughs> I think about a year or so ago, for uh, another hospital in another place, and uh, to another level of staff mostly private physicians who were interested in finding out what the latest greatest is from surgical techniques. I know every one of us is the world's best surgeon, but uh, all of us can learn. And once you get out of training, very few of us have a chance to learn new techniques unless we take courses, unless we spend our time going to Florida to the pig lab or whatever it is you're gonna do. It's a couple quick cases, they're not really very important, but this is a 32-week PIH baby with asymmetric IUGR breach, gravita one. Not my case. You know, I deliver all those vaginally. But anyway, uh, the lady came in, she got her lateral tilt, got her spinal, got her ANSIF, scalpel incision, cautery fascia, rectus was bluntly open, peritoneum bluntly open, bladder flap created, battery scissor extension, cord drainage was done, cord gases were done. Uterine massage was done after placenta was delivered. Yeah, the uterus was exteriorized. The endometrial cavity was wiped clean. Two-layer ovicral closure, figure of eight bleeder and one edge was closed. I mean, <coughs> bleeder was closed with figure eight closure. Fascia with one vicral. Sub-Q irrig irritated, I'm sorry, irrigated. Good hemostasis, subcuticular closure, for monocryl. Dressing not recorded. I usually say vinegar and oil, but then they always take that out of my dictations. Um, estimate blood loss, 800. What happened? Post-op wound infection. Okay, I know this never happens to any of you, but this, like I said, was a, one of those crazy places on the west coast before it disappears in the ocean there. Case two, gravita four, para three, 34 and a half weeks. Preterm labor, C-sections times three. Not uncommon. Came in, got her ANSEF in less than 30 minutes. Spinal supine position. <laughs> Did the same thing, fascial lens to the... Uh, Scalpel to the fascia, blunt rectal incision, rectus incision, vertical incision of the peritoneum, bladder flap was created. The lower uterine incision was done with the scalpel with manual transverse extension. Cord gas is not done, cord drainage not recorded, placenta removed te technique not recorded, uterus exteriorized, endometrial cavity wiped clean, two layer closure, copious pelvic irrigation, rectus muscle approximated with ovicral. <clears throat> fascia closed with ovicral, subcutitious irritated, uh, irrigated, closed with 3O plane, and skin closed with staples. Dressing again, not recorded. So vinegar and oil, whatever you happen to like, okay, it's the dressing they used. Post-op wound incision, bleeding, outcome. <clears throat> Why do I present these cases? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I've acquired some local <clears throat> viral goodies. Why the need to do an update? Well, you know, most of us, uh, being the world's best surgeons as we already are, don't need to update. But the few of us that go through this mental exercise occasionally, and one of the reasons most doctors didn't ever want me to assist them because I was always telling them a better way to do something. And then they said, how do you know that? And I said, I don't know, I just look at the literature. Best surgical approach is change, that's the other thing. I am now on my fifth three cycle of magnesium sulfate, about my ninth three cycle on peritoneal closure, and all of you that are over the age of 45 know that that happens about every six to seven years because we have to publish so that we don't perish. And the way we publish is by doing controlled design studies on X, Y, Z, P, Q, and R. Well, some are good, some are not so good, some of them, and a lot of them get published even though they're not so good. So you know that there's been a big effort put on to try and analyze studies from the point of view of their value, their relative value to each other. What studies are best, better, good, average, mediocre, lousy? I put in orange the speaker's license. That means it's my opinion, humble as it may be, but it's not related to any evidence-based medicine that I could find, okay? This comes from Dalkey's work uh, two years ago. I'm, ho I'm sure all of you have read it. It's very important. It is the major analytical study on cesarean section technique, all right, on how to do it. I know you think it's the world's best studied operation. It is one of the highest frequency operations in the world. <clears throat> the US Preventive Services Task Force took it upon themselves a few years ago to look at 
grading systems for studies, for what you read in the literature. Remember the thrust of the coming year is learn to read the literature with some critical eye. Don't just say, oh, it's printed, it must be true. A lot of things get printed aren't necessarily true, including my paycheck. So if you look at the grade, A, B, C, C is likely to be only small benefit, but you might want to use it. D is don't use it. Moderate or high certainty, it's not working. And I, insufficient, poor quality, blah, blah, blah. And then the level of certainty is the second part. So you have a grade and a level of certainty for the, each study, which we're going to go through. OK? High, consistent, good studies. Looks like it's the real McCoy. Moderate, meh, you know. It's efficient, we think it's going to be OK, but there's limited ability to generalize, inconsistent findings. If you look at the <clears throat> meta-analysis bar graphs, they cross the zero line too often. They're not to the left or to the right accurately enough to be of value, et cetera, et cetera. So let's go into the nitty gritty, OK? Everybody knows what we think we know, except we don't always know what we think we know. Pre-op preparation for C-sections. I don't know if you gynecologists here, you guys don't really care, but there is some sort of crossover to general surgical principles here. Okay, the first thing they found out is that, yes, you need to get prophylactic antibiotics. Either cephalosporins or ampicillin is fine in obstetrical use. It's use always, grade A, level of confidence, certainty is high. That's how these things are graded. So, so one thing we gotta do is we gotta give them antibiotics within 30 to 60 minutes. That's been studied. Grade of level, level of confidence is high, so you do it. As soon as you think you're going to do a C-section, get the antibiotic in, okay? In the old days, believe it or not, when I was <clears throat> young and the dinosaurs were still crawling on the earth, the pre-op administration of antibiotics was thought to be a bad idea because it ruined the neonatologist's ability to culture the baby adequately. It turned out to be a false assumption just for your information, those of you who don't remember history, okay? Um, there is no need for weight adjustment in case anybody teaches you that particular piece of news, okay? So just because a lady is a little short for weight, all right, and has a BMI that's a little higher than the median, you do not need to adjust the dose. The tissue levels are adequate, even in 400-pound women. If you don't believe me, read Maggio's study. <clears throat> you don't have to believe me. Thromboprophylaxis. Okay, there are no studies that proved, okay, that pneumatic compression, SCUDs versus heparin versus early ambulation made much difference. The problem with those studies has to do with the incidence of a phenomenon. You have to do thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of patients in a very controlled manner to get a clear-cut benefit of one versus the other. So just keep that in mind, okay? Current best practices most likely has to do, I hope all of us use SCUDs in the hospital that I worked at most recently, we use SCUDs on everything that lay around. All preterm labor patients, anybody in a hospital who was horizontal got SCUDs, day and night, and it, nurses were heavily criticized if they left the SCUDs off because the patient said, it's too warm, we come from everything, is too warm. No, always, okay. Next thing, and I know I talked to Mrs. Rogers about this, and I, I think we're either going to or already doing the povidine nasal swabbing. Um, it's a great seed evidence. There's no clear-cut evidence that makes much difference, except in other surgical misadventures. In orthopedics, it seems to make a difference. In maxillofacial plastic reconstructive surgery, it makes a big difference. <clears throat> the most effective intellectual approach would be to pre-screen all C-section patients for MRSA. Well, there's not my problems with that. Number one, you never know who's going to require the C-section other than repeat C-sections. And number two, uh, if you do that, you better start uh, doing all your personnel, too. So we better start walking around here with all our iodine swabs up our noses, okay? Because 35% of us carry the stuff. So we're the most dangerous animal in the hospital, as you can imagine, from that point of view. So there's some consideration about whether or not to do that. The <clears throat> latest studies on, these are um, a type of cost effectiveness study that are done in a modeling system show that it is probably not cost effective to do MRSA screening universally in pregnant women, just for your information. Pre-op body washing, chlorhexidine, iodine, usually it's chlorhexidine. 
alcohol-based chlorhexidine uh, is probably the best single antiseptic that there is. So uh, the problem with that, as you know, is anything that has alcohol in it or in the pre-op area, immediately prior to any kind of cautery or electric current is a dangerous animal. I can testify to that. So washing, however, the night before has a pretty good studies done on it, but they're not adequate. So no one's sure that it's really good. In, now we're talking about obstetrics, don't forget. Just that these studies were focused on our line of work, not global orthopedic work, for instance, which is a high level of need for extremely sterile conditions, as you well know. Osteomyelitis is a nasty piece of work. Vaginal preparation is another thing that we usually do not do. But the evidence is pretty good, as you can see here. Grade B, moderate level of certainty, that pre-op povidine iodine vaginal swabbing, as is done for vaginal hysterectomies and so on, is actually fairly effective at reducing infection rates in cesarean sections. I know we don't do it much. Doesn't mean we shouldn't be. So it might be something we should look at. Not very difficult to do. Requires a little more, you know, interference and. Another thing you have to talk to the patient about as to why you're doing it and what the purpose is and so on. But it's interesting. Catheters, operator option, okay? I'm a great believer, first of all, I operate a lot of times with no catheter at all. <clears throat> the bladder's not the problem. If you can't find the bladder as an obstetrical surgeon, you're in trouble in the first place. Uh, take it out fast. That has some trade-offs because of the fact that we use bladder uh, inhibiting drugs occasionally in our line of work. You know, we have epidurals on, on board that sometimes last longer than they should. We use magnesium sulfate. They f we drown them in fluids so their bladders go boonk in about 30 minutes, you know, and now we take the catheter out. <laughs> they don't know that they've got to go pee. So we'll be careful with it. But it's a grade C operator option type of studies that they reviewed. Supplemental oxygen, just to kill that, is, shows no evidence of improvement of anything. So giving women preoperative, intraoperative, high nasal mask, I'm sorry, mask oxygen does not, is not effective. Okay, now we come to the nitty gritty stuff this is where the surgeons start to pay attention, all right? What kind of incisions to use and how to enter and how to get out and all the things you do while you're mucking around in there. Well, there are a whole bunch of different incision types. I'm not gonna go to everyone in detail. If you wanna look it up, look up <clears throat> this particular paper and um, you can see that there's a, you know, the standard stuff we use. I use a Fan and Steel Joel Cohen uh, mix. So if you, I'll show you what they look like. Okay, just so if you've never seen them. Um, this is the Maillard. This is hardly ever used except in oncologic surgeries and stuff like that. High, high mid-abdominal uh, incisions, cuts the rectus muscles on both sides. You got the inferior epigastrics to worry about because they bleed like bloody stink if you hit them. Uh, the Joel Cohen is the straight across but higher above the symphysis. The Fan and Steel is the curved going into the escutcheon. And a lot of us, I suspect, do the intermediate. We do a Joel Cohen right at the Fan and Steel line <clears throat> because we're very conscious of women's ability and need to wear bikinis. Not only that, it's the finest incision. Transverse incisions are not done because of bikinis, in case you didn't know that. They're done for the simple reason that when you cough, you close the incision along the stretch lines. You know, remember the body stretch lines you learned in medical school? Those little, little line jobbers all over the body that they taught you on the dummies? <clears throat> when you cough, you close your incision. When you cough with a vertical, you open the incision. Big difference. Okay, incision types. Operator preference, basically, okay? Misgav Ladach is a fan and steel incision that mainly has to do with the types of entry all the way to the peritoneum. Now, I'm a blunt entry type guy, you know, because I'm fast. I don't have time to fool around with cutting myself with scalpels and all those kind of nasty things that we use. So if speed is everything, blunt entry is a good way to do it. The only time you get defeated is when you have multiple prior C-section, and even better when your predecessor has decided to close the rectus with sutures. So it's like a rock in the middle. Just my personal prejudice. But it basically, the incision is operator preference, by all the studies that have been done. Dissecting the fascia. Inferiorly, again, I don't do it. Doesn't mean it's the best thing to do, but it may decrease blood loss slightly if you do not do it. Okay, so you don't gotta go dissect the fascia all the way down. Go in there, zip, zip, 
open, boom, blunt entry in the perineum, you're there, bang, end of story. Takes about two minutes, one minute if you're, fun, if you're fast. <clears throat> I don't care what, I don't let patients see anything on YouTube, they do whatever they want. And we do what we want. If we do the best we can, then I think that's the best we can do. Intraoperative technique number two here. Bladder flap development, don't do it. You don't need a bladder flap, okay? Increases uh, flat bladder frequency and or adhesions both. So doing a bladder flap was a grade D. It was, it was evident you should not be doing it, okay? Level of uh, certainty is pretty moderate. So <clears throat> most of my associates when we operate, we never create a bladder flap anymore. We used to all the time. Push everything down, you know, oh man, it's gotta go down out of the way so we don't get in any kind of big trouble. You don't get in trouble. Um, if you get in trouble, you should know how to close a bladder. It's not a big deal, okay? Any competent obstetrical surgeon knows how to close a bladder. Self-retaining retractors, okay? Again, operator preference. I know the latest thing is the, the, big, the big round ring, and then we've had all sorts of other retractors. Personally, I don't use retractors. What do you need a retractor for? You've got an assistant, that's the retractor. If you're an old army surgeon like me, you don't need an assistant even. We never had assistants. We only had <coughs> a nurse to help us. So we got in there fast, you know, get it out of the way, go in. So it's up to you. It's just a waste of time in my opinion, most of the time. There are occasions, and nothing's ever perfect. There are occasions when, for obvious reasons, you need a much better exposure, okay? You've got multiple adhesions in front of the uterus, you know, you're dissecting an incredible mess. Nice to have a, everything a little bit out of the way so that you can do your packing properly and know where you're at. Expansion of the uterine incision. Okay, now this is something that very few of us do. I've, got, I've started doing it ever since reading this paper. <coughs> it works beautifully. You know, you go down, you find out where you're gonna make the uterine incision, lower uterine segment if possible, so you're out of the endometrium. And you make a little nick, and you take a little forcep, you go open it up about a centimeter, put your finger there and go cephalad caudad, not transversely, that's the point. Cephalad caudad, it'll tear right along the plane without a problem whatsoever. If you don't believe it, do it next time. See what happens. It's very effective, <clears throat> has a grade A level of certainty high. So, not much to argue with as far as evidence-based medicines go until you've read this article and then you can argue about evidence-based medicine. Evidence yeah, in there, exactly. You got it. So that's one thing that uh, I think if you're not doing it, give it a try. You have less chance, you don't tear in the uterine arteries, you're not gonna get in trouble. Bandage scissors are dangerous, they're, they're deadly instruments. <laughs> not to mention people, children have been injured with bandage scissors, especially ruptured membranes. Intraoperative techniques, placental removal versus, versus spontaneous expulsion, okay? Don't remove the placenta by hand, okay? You remove it just the way mother nature does it. Rub the uterus, contract it, give Pitocin, expel it slowly. It, keeps you from bleeding. That's the whole purpose of the uterine contraction onto the placenta, right? You grab the placenta off, what do you got? A huge giant balloon that can't wait to bleed out. What's the average blood loss of an open uterus? Somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 to 600 milliliters a minute. <clears throat> you all know that if you've ever been in a postpartum hemorrhage. Placental drainage. I do this routinely for a number of reasons. First, I'm a paranatologist, and I sort of believe that uh, it's good for preemies, so I strip the cord on all preemies. I strip the cord on almost every kid. And if I don't strip the cord, I let the placenta drain always, vaginally or abdominally, after getting your little cord specimen, you know, and well, gases if you happen to need, all that kind of stuff. But drain the placenta, just unclamp it. What's the clamp there for? Nothing, it just gets in the way. So I just hang the cord over the edge of the drape into the <clears throat> Little catch pocket, and away you go. And it does decrease fetal maternal transfusion. Now, grantedly, in most cases, what difference does it make? It's unclear what difference it makes. Other than if the mother happens to be Rh negative and it's an Rh positive baby, in which case decreasing fetal maternal transfusion has some benefit. There's another thing, you know, that I've always thought that some of the chilling women get after deliveries quite commonly may be related to this. That's never been proven one way or another. A lot of it was thought to be, you know, to the hyperthermia of labor and so on and so forth, but <clears throat> I've never been 100% convinced and I've never done the study to prove it either way, but think about it, it's a rather massive transfusion of antigenically dissimilar material. 
could also be just amniotic fluid going into your bloodstream and you not having an anaphylactic reaction. There's many explanations for why women chill so badly sometimes after deliveries, but keep that in mind. Uterine exteriorization, my favorite in the whole world. Okay, do you keep the uterus in or do you exteriorize it? The difference is unclear. But if you do pull uteruses out, remember they have a higher incidence of nausea, vomiting, and tachycardia. That's been clearly shown in a number of rather good studies. <coughs> it's operator preference, it's a great eye. Level of certainty is high that <laughs> we're not sure whether or not to do it. I never do it, never. Once in a hundred times maybe. I find it a waste of time, then I have to squeeze the stupid uterus back into that little hole that I made to try and get it back in there, which can't be very good for the tubes and everything else you've yanked out with it. So I've always found it to be a rather pointless exercise. I've never had a problem repairing a lower uterine segment in, in situ. I mean, if you can't do that, how do you do hysterectomies, right? Cervical dilation, simply don't do them, end of story. That's been dead a long time, but got into literature years and years ago and the mistaking idea that you just stick an instrument through the cervix so that the <coughs> lochia can escape. Well, unless the woman never menstruated, you sort of figure that she must have had an opening in her cervix once upon a time, right? I mean, she got pregnant and so forth. Yes? Yes, just turn the uterus to the side. Clap, step, step, boom, done. Next side, boom, boom, done. Two minutes each side, that's it, that's all you get. <clears throat> but, you know, nothing is ever 100%, okay? You do it what you need technically to be correct. If you have a situation where you've got adhesions, where it's complicated, where, you know, this is pablum. You all have to deal in the real world where there's a lot of little minute exceptions. So we're looking at the massive volume of cesareans not the exceptions. Do I ever exteriorize a uterus? Of course I do. I did a posterior cesarean section one time. Uterus was completely torqued 180 degrees in a double uterus to boot. So we got in the wrong side horn in the first place and then we got into the posterior aspect and then we got that all figured out and got the right baby out of the right horn. Then we finally figured out, gee, this looks a little odd. Closed it all up and bloop, the uterus. And she had the, probably one of the few posterior cesarean sections you'll ever encounter. But if you see that off note, that was probably one of mine. This is why I love exteriorizing uterus. <laughs> Look at that, in that great picture? I mean, just wonder what that great clamp is doing up on the top of that uterine front. It's, you know, it's just made a five centimeter gouged hole. Anyway, I just love that picture. So, closure of uterine incision. Now, here we go. Oh, operator preference again. Single versus double layer. Double layer closure is still controversial. It's not thought to be of any benefit if you're not going to have any further kids, I guess. I was always taught, which doesn't mean it's good, that one of the reasons to do double layer closure was, first of all, the first layer should approximate the segments end to end, not invert them, because there is a chance you could be somewhere where there's endometrium, and you potentially cause adenomyosis. When I did this <coughs> in my postgraduate training, we actually looked at slices of cesarean hysterectomies from, with prior stories, and you did see some endometrial tissue in the scar and stuff. So I've always avoided doing that. I do it as much as possible, and end to end, first layer, and then a sort of an imbricating second layer, but unencumbered by too much scientific evidence. So it's operator preference as to one versus two closures, okay? Personally, I always do two closures because I sleep better. Most important part of the whole closure, which is not studied per se, because nobody ever dictates it accurately, is how do you secure the angle of the incision? They're the most critical part of the entire job. Okay, you put your needle driver and your needle far enough laterally that you're occluding the lateral branches, okay, of the ascending cervical or uterine artery, <clears throat> you get the job done. But if you just whip them in there, you're never sure. And have I, ever, have I ever been back on a take back? Not on mine, on other doctors for sure. And what do we find? Pumping right down through the vaginal opening, cervix. Elective appendectomy not recommended. I don't know, does anybody here ever do elect, elective appendectomies in cesarean? I haven't actually ever seen one, I have to admit. So I guess except if you're gonna be a submariner, I'm not so sure that's highly indicated. Intraabdominal irrigation, don't do it. Okay, there's plenty of good evidence. It's a grade D study that it significantly increases nausea, has no benefit in infection or GI function. You're just kidding yourself and you're wasting a lot of time and a lot of nice sa sterile saline. 
and you're mucking around and putting the suckers down behind and all this kind of stuff. Totally unnecessary. <clears throat> I haven't done that in years, and I don't have any higher infection rate than anybody else. Intraoperative techniques, perineal closure. Oh, this is sort of fun. The, the studies made my eyes cross when I had to read them all. Um, the bottom line is that closing the peritoneum may reduce adhesions or may increase adhesions or may do nothing for adhesions, depending on whom you wish to believe this year. So I put the orange probably in there. It's a grade C, level of certainty, moderate. Um, I personally generally close the peritoneum really quickly, trying not to get anything that looks like bowel into it, for the simple reason that I'm not sure what's best. I've done it both ways. I did it for years not closing it because it was very fast. Then I sort of read the literature which said that maybe we should be closing it because it does reduce adhesions, and now I don't know, so I just do it by routine, close, close the peritoneum. You don't close the peritoneum, <clears throat> no one can argue with you. Well, I don't know who would do anything else. I mean, sharp dissections of peritoneum, you, you're, you're asking for trouble. There's stuff under there you don't want to hit. And if your scalpel goes too deep, you're going, to be, you're going to regret having a scalpel in your hand, in my opinion. So I don't know. Hmm? That was a recent paper that said that if you blunt it, you do no. Right. 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 But again, it's the, the Japanese, they did sharp dissection, and they thought you should close it. And everybody else thought it doesn't make any difference. And some thought it actually reduced adhesions. So all I can say is the ball is still sort of floating up in the air. I just think. The cleaner you are, the better off you get. And some days you just don't get lucky. I think there are people, I, I did a lady one time, as I've quoted many times, that her, did her 13th cesarean section. She had not one single adhesion to the entire abdomen. Not one. Most amazing thing I've ever seen. I mean, this is a woman who should have had 13 C-sections. <clears throat> so blunt needles. Now, I don't know that we use them all. I have to tell you, I'm not a great fan of blunt needles. But in a training program, I think you ought to really consider whether or not we should be using blunt needles. Okay, they really diminish needle stick problems. Okay, and they're not that difficult to use. I know at first it sounds, you know, who wants to use a blunt needle? Well, the kind of tissue we operate on, blunt needles go through just fine. The fascia is usually the only area where you have to push a little and know exactly what you're doing. But if you're in a training program, I think we ought to think about getting some blunt needles out. The other thing which wasn't studied is the issue of gloving. And there's clear evidence that double gloving is the only really appropriate way to operate, okay? Because the tears in gloves are ubiquitous. Lots of gloves tear, even though you don't realize it. And when they did, you know, actual counts on bacterial, bacteria in the gloves and so on, the double glove was vastly superior. Hand washing has to be done. It's more a matter of numbers of scrubs, not time. Two minutes is as good as 12 minutes. So you don't have to ruin your skin, but you have to use, you know, chlorhexidine or providing, whichever you prefer or less allergic to, and you have to do speed. Numbers of strokes is what counts. We don't use the high pressure washer cleaners like some places do, but it's just an interesting sidelight that some of the things we're trained to do don't hold up in the evidence of time. So postpartum hemorrhage prevention, oh yeah, well, you know, we all use oxytocin, syntocin, whatever you want to call it. Um, the bolus infusion has no known clear-cut benefit. Okay, you can just open the drip up that this anesthesiologist is hopefully controlling with great love and affection, and it gives a grade B, pretty high level of certainty that it's effective. Okay, mesoprostol uh, did not, was not superior to oxytocin using it either rectally or sublingually, since you know you can do both both for labor induction and this purpose. <clears throat> so um, there were no trials that showed that misoprostol was more effective than oxytocin, or as effective. Even carbitocin, which we don't use much, I don't even know if it's available here, is an oxytocin agonist, and there was no not superior to oxytocin. Tranexamic acid, which I've been looking at, but I never had, had the courage to start using it yet in our systems. Um, has a great B, moderate level of certainty. There are some problems with it having to do with thromboembolic phenomenon. It does decrease blood loss, and you have to use it ahead approximately 750 to a gram IV before the operation starts. It's an antifibrinolytic, 
does a pretty good job, but you know, women who are hypercoagulable, you always sort of worry about a little bit because you're adding an agent that theoretically induces clotting. Therefore, since we are very sensitized to worrying about women clotting inadvertently, we're very worried about using trinexamic acid. But <clears throat> I think we should wait for some further studies. <laughs> Subcutaneous closure versus drains this is one of my favorite pet peeves. Uh, because I always do it wrong. Um, the studies showed that in more than two centimeters subcutaneous thickness, you should use subcutaneous, sub subcutaneous closures. Okay, whether you use intermittent or continuous isn't clear. I always use intermittent, interrupted, I'm sorry, because I like as little suture material as possible in there. So, you know, four or five interrupteds with a deep knot. I just do that out of habit. And it clearly makes a big difference as far as hematoma, seroma, and intra wound and post-operative wound infection rates goes. So I'm really convinced that we should advocate that for all of our residency training programs to put in them. It's a little bit, you know, it takes another few minutes to do it right, but it does make a difference according to the grade D evidence showing that not using it is bad. That's what grade D means, okay? It means it's grade D evidence that not using the suture is a good idea. So in other words, it's a sort of inverted way of looking at it. It's a good idea to put it in, okay? The drain story, this really blew me away. I have to admit, you know, I, I, I've told some of you, you know, my old days, all I did was morbidly obese C-sections. That's what perinatologists did in Sacramento, California. We got them all, every single last one of them. So we got very good at them with our very good anesthesia team, which is another reason why they came to us. But I routinely used closed suction drains deep, above the fascia, just in the dead space of the, of the wounds itself, through a stab wound, sutured in, and then occluded the openings with occlusive dressings. And I have to tell you, I sort of thought that it worked pretty darn well. I had very, we had very few hematomas, seromas, post-operative abscesses, et cetera. But we did it on a very strict protocol, left them in, you know, for 36 hours. Those kinds of drains, compression drains, one-way suction, no open drains, no open wound, no nothing. Everything was sealed. Tegaderm seal or whatever. So I put the orange on the bottom there. Heslan says, I'm not sure if it was proper drain techniques used because the studies, you can't really discern exactly how the drains were used. And there's different ways of using them. You can put them through a stab wound. You can put them at the edge of the incision. You can occlusive dress them. You can occlusive, blah, 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 blah. So I don't know. I don't use them anymore. Yeah. We, we never put drains in, even in our, in our thrombocytopenic. We had tons of thrombocytopenic patients, every preeclamptic help, ITP, thrombotic thrombocytopenia, purpura, whatever the hell we dealt with. <clears throat> that was never the indication for the drain, no. That, per se, we didn't have much problems with. You got 20,000 platelets, you're going to live. You get down below 10, then you get a little quit. It makes me a little uneasy, but not necessarily from the wound point of view. But, I mean, it's a good idea. So anyway, I... I I would say that if somebody puts a drain in and has a cogent reason for doing it, I think there's no evidence to say that that's the most terrible thing you've ever heard of, okay? But in general, I think you use, you use your subcutaneous sutures, close the dead space, close the skin up. Skin closure, okay, operator preference. You see, I finally remembered the name Quill Sutures. Where's my little favorite resin? Oh, she's not here today. Um, the quill suture is what I use. Uh, that doesn't make it good. Uh, you can see my favorite picture of what happens when you put staples in. You know, you did nothing but cause little local reactions and stuff. They hurt like heck going out. Staples don't hurt going in. They only hurt going, coming out. Use an occlusive dressing. Yes. You can use all sorts of different types of occlusive dressing. And the latest rage in our hospital was vacuum-assisted closure. I found it a lot of extra stuff, you know. I just use centrally absorbent tegaderm closures like on the right-hand side there. There's no recommendation to cover an incision beyond 48 hours. So that's interesting because five, six, eight years ago when I started the study on Tegaderm, complete occlusion, which wasn't done at all in our hospital, they just put a cotton fluff on there and then took it off in 12 hours. Um, the study, at those, those studies initially showed that the Tegaderm should stay on three to four days. 
that's subsequently been revised, at least in obstetrics, to 48 hours. So my partners, of course, always ripped the tegaderm off just as soon as they felt like it when they came on duty, even though I'd written on them, do not remove for four days or whatever. That didn't inhibit them any. And they were right and I was wrong. So it's an unresolved issue about um, whether or not anything about 48 hours as far as an occlusive dressing really has a purpose to it. Uh, I'm not sure. Do you all use cyanoacrylate around here? Glue? Skin glue? Yeah? Okay. Uh, skin glue is a good thing to use. You know, it seems to work relatively well with, um, in most cases, if you apply it properly. Uh, and how about vacuum-assisted closures? You have the vacuum-assisted tachyderm closures? That's another, another thought. I think that works more in all kinds of other situations. What are Dr. Holmes. <coughs> skin. Quill for skin. For skin. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No knots. Just ch -ch 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 pull. Done. No knots, no tying, no nothing. Since the surgery can't reverse itself, you start in the middle and you go to both ends, double ended, you know. Done. What? Maybe. I just found it sort of interesting. No, I, I guess I wasn't informed of the cost. They just said, hey, you want to try this? And I said, sure, that's pretty cool. You just have to take those famous things called steri strips and reapproximate everything and do your Z plasties and, you know, got all the edges to fold back under. No, you're absolutely right. Don't, you can't foul up. <laughs> if you make a mistake, it's, you got to pull the suture or cut it or whatever and go back and do it a second time. So I'm a, I, I, I use it. I find it good. I used to use nothing but monocryl type, you know, 4 0 monocryl or something like that. And I found this to be just as good. You don't need them in there forever and ever. But the, the, end, the, the studies did show that on a, on a blinded closure, not a blinded, a, an open closure, an open study, that the women who had the subcuticular in one half of their incision and the wing clips in the other half, the skin clips in the other half, had a finer cosmetic outcome with the subcuticular suture. Better looking scar. Uniformly thought so. By the patient, by the doctors, and by the independent nurse observers, it was a three-armed observation study. So I'm pretty convinced that subcuticular is a nice way to go. It does take five to seven minutes more time depending on the speed of the operator. So your 20 minute C-section may be 27 minutes, but you'll be forgiven. So here's what the current techniques are that we should be using. Clip the hair at the surgical site. You know that, right? We don't shave, we don't depilitate, we don't do anything, we clip it. Antibiotic prophylaxis, 15 to 60 minutes. We know about the uterine incision, you know. Small nick with a scalpel. Don't hit the kid's head if possible. Take a little clamp, force it, spread it open, get your fingers in and pull. Remove the placenta by spontaneous extrusion, massaging the fundus. I always massage the fundus just because I'm an old time doc and I've saved a lot of women's lives by massaging the fundus in the old days when <coughs> agents such as misoprostol hadn't even been invented yet. Uterine exteriorization, surgeon preference. I personally think it's pointless, but leave it up to you. You do enclosure in two layers and listen no future fertility is desired, as I said. That's, what, that's Duff's latest study in 2010 showed that, like I said, it's controversial still. Sub-Q closure of more than two centimeters, post-op pit for about four hours plus, and scuds or heparin, depending probably on level of risk and your personal feeling of uncertainty about, you know, anybody's had a prior something or other event, you might want to get more aggressive. So. Here's the things that are sort of the newer approaches that we are concerned about. Trinexamic acid pre-op, like I said, I think we should wait for more studies to come out <clears throat> before we get on that bandwagon. Uh, it may be, uh, I think, you know, mainly blunt entry, cephalocaudad uterine, no uterine exteriorization. Use a barbed suture quill if you happen to like that kind of thing. I like it because you don't have all the bunching at the end and all the funny knots you got to pull and all that kind of nonsense. And or cyanoacrylate, which you're using, or vacuum closures. And the last but not least, which drives me as a quality assurance reviewer, constantly insane is, I get nothing but dictations, estimated blood loss, C-section 500 mLs. The Harley is such an animal. Okay, the average blood loss, it's a serious somewhere between 800 and 1,000 mLs. That's average. That's just the local, I don't think she bled very much type C-section if you actually measure it. In our hospital, we had a new initiative about two years ago where we had 
pictorial uh, displays on all, all our walls, labor and delivery walls, delivery rooms that showed how much blood it takes to soak an average lap tape. Quarter soaked, half soaked, full soaked, okay? 25 mLs, 50 mLs, 75 mLs, and so forth. So you can get a pictorial quick look. You've got, you know, 15 bloody rats on the wall. You've lost more than 150 mLs, that's a given. So we did that in order to convince our operators to start recording something that resembled accurate, because it doesn't make any sense. You know, if you lose 500 mLs, your crit doesn't drop at all. So you have a woman come in and post them. All of a sudden, their crits drop like a rock. How the hell did you lose 500 mLs? Where did all the rest of the blood go? Very obvious questions, OK? So I think uh, one thing you can do, too, is immediately, once the amniotic fluid is out, if she doesn't have ruptured membranes already, is to empty. You know, they all have little empty ports on the bottom. Empty the side bags, close them, and the rest of the blood loss will be blood. You can pretty well estimate how much that is. If you tilted, like you said, you have the little markers on most of the drapes have markers on their sides. <laughs> and here's the old habits we've got to try and avoid. Supplemental oxygen, bladder flaps, you need a bladder flap, cervical dilation, manual placental removal, intraoperative irrigation has no point to it. In general, now there's, there's exceptions to everything, okay? Just remember, I'm not, the woman's got a fever and just pus porn out of the uterus, you might think of a different thought, then that you have a different surgical necessity, different surgical environment to deal with. You know, we're supposed to be surgeons, we're supposed to know this stuff. Leaving the peritoneum open, I wouldn't quibble either way because, as Dr. Harrell points out, you know, the studies may depend in part on how you enter the peritoneum, and I suspect it has something to do with the actual person's propensity to how they heal, how effectively they get fibroblast crossing, and whether or not they get bowel that adhere and so on, because like I said, Here's a woman with 13 C-sections, not one adhesion. How the hell do you explain that? I think that was just her, not the great surgeons you had ahead of her. Um, subcutaneous drains, I don't use anymore. I'm almost never. Okay? So, um, now the non-RCT tested stuff, vaginal preparation pre-op. Okay, we talked about that. I found, much to my surprise, because I'm going to do a forceps uh, talk a little later today with a uh, postgraduate physicians that you do have a lot of forceps in the OR tables at all times. I had a great experience which caused me an immense amount of grief where I <clears throat> had a baby that I was trying to get out of a uterus, a preemie, why, what else would I be doing? And uh, the child had so much hair we couldn't, we couldn't get the kid out of the uterus for multiple reasons, including the fact she hadn't had adequate labor and the lower urine segment was only about that wide and, we, and then all sorts of hair and we didn't want to do a T incision because the head was right there but we couldn't get it through. Two strong guys couldn't get this kid out. Vacuum, sure, great idea. Vacuum, boom, came right off. Kid had the most hair you've ever seen, okay? A lot more hair than I do. And tried it twice, wouldn't even stick so there was no point in continuing. So I asked for forceps just assuming that a first-rate perinatal unit operating room would have a forceps there. Oh, no. They had to go down the hallway, and they sort of nonchalantly walked on. I waited for a minute and a half, two minutes. Finally, the forceps arrived. And I said, get me the forceps. They brought me what? Pipers. <laughs> no, it's not a joke. Pipers. I, put the pi I took the pipers, on the, put them at the edge of the table, and said, get me short forceps. The pipers dropped off the edge of the table. Clang, bang. I was accused of throwing forceps at the local personnel. And I said, get the forceps now. So, of course, they finally get me some forceps. We get the kid out of it. Then I have this you know, quality assurance meeting with all of the concerned personnel. And I was told, you know, why did you throw the forceps? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? I said, well, here's how it goes sometimes in life. There's always the rest of the story. What you all didn't know is, is the cord had prolapsed past the kid's head. And we couldn't get it back up. For the same reason, we couldn't get the kid's head out. So I didn't have enough time to have a long, esoteric discussion as to why short Lao forceps really should be there always, you know, if the vacuum doesn't work. And just because you haven't ever seen vacuum failure on a preemie doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Blah, blah, blah. So they all said, okay, okay. I didn't ever 3D throw the force. It'd be just, they're so long, they just went right over the end of the table. So that's just a story about forceps. 
Pre-count emergency CPAC, this is my personal favorite. Nobody believes in me except me. U.S. Army runs on pre-counted packs, okay? You don't have to count squat. What I don't understand is in our hospital, not here, my previous experience hospital, perinatal unit, I could never convince them. It's against hospital policy. Now, you know that drives me insane a priori, but it's against hospital policy to have pre-counted packs. So when you had emergency C-section, they'd flip the stuff open, they'd give you all the instruments, and then they would wait for 25 minutes till the x-ray machine arrived. While the woman was still on the OR table, blah, 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 blah. This, of course, drives Dr. H totally ballistic. So I said, why are we doing this? Why don't we have a double-counted, triple-counted, God-certified pack that says here's how many instruments and lap tapes are in there? No, we can't do that. I ask you. Why we can't do that is beyond me. I mean, what's the difference between a count by two nurses with an open table versus a count that's bandaged up and signed and sheeted? And that's your count. And you, if the instrument count is the same as you started and your pre-counted pack, you don't need an x-ray. How many instruments have I lost inside a woman so far? Knock on wood, zero. And you know that the only instruments that get lost inside people is when the count is correct. Otherwise, you wouldn't have closed the patient. Get it? There, there, there's a problem with our logic system somewhere. Anyway, time out. Oh, flash burns. <clears throat> Sutter lost a lot of money on a flash burn, thanks to me. It's their own stupid mistake. They had decided that the suction clips that hold our suction tubing, which doesn't, isn't used much anymore, I don't all hopefully, were metal alligator clips. You ever seen those little jobs? You put the suction through them and the alligator clips and they clip them on the drape, right? And the alcohol runs down the lady's leg and we had a short in the wire of the cautery. I use hot cautery all the time. Short in the wire, jumped right down, burned through the wet drape into her leg. Left a little scar that big. I don't know she got 5,000 bucks or something, but you know. It is a risk, and so I never use metal clips on a drape at all, ever, for any reason whatsoever, for that reason. Surely we now do the time out. We do the, you know, the evaporating weight. You know, and hopefully you have that 120 second where you're all standing around twiddling your thumbs, twiddling your thumbs while this stuff evaporates. All good. Flash burns are bad stuff. Cautery shouldn't touch the issue, tissue. That's not commonly taught, but if any use hot cautery, okay? Look back on the animal studies. You don't touch the tissue with the cautery tip. You make it jump. You make it arc. It minimizes thermal burn distances. Clearly proven. That's a 1A one, one evidence. So don't touch the tissue. Pressure dressing should apply pressure. That's Hesline's favorite, okay? You know, I say put on big pressure dressing. Oh, they put on this little 4x4, four four, you know, one piece of tape. I'm saying, I'm missing something. Isn't pressure dressing supposed to apply pressure? Well, yes, Dr. H, but what do you want us to do? I said, large pieces of bandage. And I teach people, you know, that skin blistering is a function of pressure per square centimeter, right? So you need to have lots of area of the tape to pull on, not just one square inch. Keep that in mind. Lots of tape on the sides so you have very little pull on each skin area. Does that make sense? Seems to be poorly taught in most institutions. Occlusive dressing, central absorbing panel, <clears throat> monitor operative times, and uncomplicated C-sections. Now, you know, I'm fully cognizant of the difference between old pros doing this and a teaching service. But I will tell you, when we did the analysis of operating times in our August hospital in the past, several hospitals, it was a bell-shaped distribution. There were pros who actually took an hour and four minutes to do a standard primary C-section. I have no idea yet what they did for an hour and four minutes, <laughs> but that's what the time was. <laughs> so I just point that out. And don't forget the survey monkey. That's it. Thanks very much. OK, questions. <laughs> Anybody have any pregnant questions, so to speak? Yes. Yes. What did you find about that? Like, do you approximate where's the burn? I guess you just leave it. In general. And then we second, never, like, we never made a flat. Never made a flat. Well, there's no flat or flap. 
So there, I mean, there, you, you're still cutting uterine serosa, if you will, you know, at that reflection point. But no, we don't, we don't close anything. Okay, and then the, 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 No, I, I, didn't, I didn't actually, to tell you the honest truth, I didn't investigate temperature water personally. I, I looked at it a long time ago from the point of view that uh, <clears throat> we were converting in our hospitals from all iodine-based scrubs to chlorhexidine, alcohol chlorhexidine and chlorhexidine, depending on which you favored, and, and then straight alcohol, which some people prefer because some people get highly allergic to both povidine and, and the chlorhexidine ingredients, so straight alcohol works. All I ever found was and nobody clearly addressed temperature of water, to be the honest truth. That doesn't mean it hasn't been done, but I don't know if there's such a study. You can look it up, see if you can find something. But the thing that I found that's most critical is the number of scrubs you do. I just happen to be a high-speed scrubber because I don't have time for this nonsense. You know, you do the nails once at the beginning of the day in detail, and you scrub high speed, you know, 40 strokes per surface takes a minute, okay? With a, and I use those soft, I have lots of them, I love those soft sponges, uh, scrub sponges made by um, <clears throat> the company out of Utah. They are a wonderful scrub sponge, used for everything. I comb my hair with it, I do my beard with it, you can clean your shoes with it. It's the best scrub brush made in the world with a little hundred little bristles, you know? Very good. And has no sponge on it. It's just a scrub brush. There's no, no sponge connected to it. I know we use a lot of preloaded sponges. So anyway, that's all I know. So it's, it's numbers of scrubs and using chlorhexidine and or povoiodine. Chlorhexidine is better. Overall bacterial count is slightly better. In a hurry, there's another thing that's interesting. In a hurry, if you're doing a crash section, we're doing a crash section with the bare hands. I have. And the in, why? Because the entering studies showed that if you've washed repetitively in an operating room environment, during a day, your count's so low to start with, you just run water over your hands and rub them. And your bacterial count drops almost as close as if you're using scrub solution. It's sort of an interesting phenomenon. So, you know, where they, all these signs say, please wash your hands, that's the important part, is washing the hands with water. The bacterial count goes way down. So you, can, you don't have to be so worried. The other thing that I didn't mention that I thought about and I used a lot is orthopedic gloves instead of double gloving, and the trick for double gloving generally is to use a larger glove underneath, a half size larger, and a small, and your regular size glove on top, not the reverse. Then you have a loose material. So it's the reverse, okay? <clears throat> Eight's underneath, seven and a half on top. That's my hand size, if you use double glove. I don't, I use ortho gloves. I love orthopedic gloves. They're about twice the thickness. Why? Because you know, orthopedists have to use them and you know, there will be people who want to tear things into pieces. No, they're dealing with dangerous instruments in dangerous environments. And so their glove tear has to be reduced. So if you can get them and you happen to like them, you might want to look into getting them rather than buy the cost of two gloves. And I don't know what the trade-off is. Maybe the ortho gloves are too expensive. They, they took mine away. They took mine away and then I got them secretly. You do? And they're three times or four times expensive as a regular gloves. Right. Okay, well, I, I, not, not a personal worry I had, but you know, I'm, I'm all for that. Sorry, I'm in your way. No. Well, I'm just thinking that this kind of this kind of stuff lends itself great to research projects and residency programs. I mean, you really want to do something cool, you know, look at a couple of these things and see if you can put together a little, a little trial that's two-armed or three-armed if you have to be. And, you know, you could easily do bacterial counts at the end of a case given, or do a glove integrity test if you don't believe this stuff. See how many of your gloves actually have holes in them at the end of a case, you know, that you never recognized because they are just pinholes. They're not obviously huge tears. Well, what do you do if you get a tear? <clears throat> Two things that, th that they showed in all these studies is, one, if you get a tear, get off the case as elegantly as you can and change the glove if you can. Best of all, change both gloves because you probably touched your other hand with the ruptured glove, so I always change both. That's one trick. And there was something else that they, that they mentioned about tearing in, in uh, operative, oh, 
<coughs> sneezing and coughing. They highly recommend, and I didn't bring the slide, it's sort of hysterical of when things go wrong in OR, this is a hysterical slide I have somewhere. They highly recommend that if you are coughing or sneezing, you need to have your mask changed, okay? <coughs> because very few of the masks will actually, they're designed, you know, to, to protect against normal exhalation of particles from your mouth. They're not designed to cover that. So turn away from the field, cough, have them change your mask. That's, that was the recommendation. Marty. Mid-transverse C-section, what are my thoughts? Well, they're pretty high, you know. <laughs> I, I would, well, I wouldn't say that necessarily, having done a few myself for all sorts of complicated and very messy reasons, you know, entrapped fetuses with pus rolling out and you can't get them out, you're not you know, transverse oblique lies, ruptured for four days. I mean, these kids are in there like a concrete cast. That they're alive is a miracle, but Sometimes, I mean, I would not think that there's any much difference. Uh, the rupture rates, if that's what you're asking, okay, are, are unclear. They're probably nearly what a vertical would be if you're doing standard vertical cesarean, because you're up way up in the myometrium. It's no, it's no different than if Dr. Harrell and I had taken out, you know, 15 fibroids and gotten into the cavity multiple times. There's a risk to that. But however, to my knowledge, not prospectively studied. So you do what you do. We're done. No, I'm, I'm just answering questions. I'm done anyway. You all have more important, fun things to do? What about sutra preference for the needle? Oh, I like, I, I'm, a, I'm an old chromic guy. I like fast, highly absorbable suture that doesn't stay for a long period of time. There's no purpose to it. The uterus heals rather rapidly. And you know, if you've ever gone in on C-sections two or three days later, like unfortunately I have had to, right? What do you see? Gnarled up, knotted up bunches of suture material because the uterus is not contracted down to that big and your suture that was so beautifully, elegantly, you know, in my case, elegantly sutured is now bunched up like a Gordian knot down there because the incision is only about that big at that point. And all your suture material is bunched around that area. So I think you stuff that goes away fast. With, what's, what's the purpose to it? I mean, I don't use vic I don't, Chromic's cheap, right? Is chromic cheap? Yeah. Moderately cheap? <laughs> Pardon me? And anything that moves. I, I'm, I'm, I'm too old and care too little to have to change constantly for various and sundry gravita numbers, you know? If it works on one, it works on all. We're done. fascia. Generally, I use what they throw in my hand. I just say, next, boom. You know, it depends on whatever operator I, has been there before and the nurse is ingrained. You know, and she like, if that guy or gal like PDS, like my partners used to love, I'll use PDS. They give me Vicro, I use Vicro. They give me rope, I, give, I use rope. <laughs> Monocryl, I use a lot of it's not anything. Keep it there. Keep it there. I've seen it done. <laughs> no, most people would not use chromic on the fascia, I would guess. Except for Dr. Holmes. You can use staples. All righty. I'll see you guys at about 11-ish. All right. Somebody go organize some gloves, would you? Gloves. You know, they'll throw away, can you get a bunch of gloves so we can use the mannequins so we don't get goo and crap all over our hands? for the forceps. Yeah. We've got the forceps coming, the mannequins coming, and all that stuff, but I think I forgot whether we have a box of gloves. You know, one of those blue glove things, okay? <laughs>